That's us. Good to go. All right. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Smiling faces. I love it. All right. Well, welcome, welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for spending your evening with us tonight uh, for the Cooper Innovation Hub's Entrepreneurial Journey Speaker Series titled Transforming Communities, The Power of Entrepreneurship and Recovery. We've got an exciting lineup of speakers tonight. Uh, my name is Josh. I'm the Recovery Program Coordinator here at the Innovation Hub. And that sounds kind of fancy. What it means is I build bridges between the entrepreneurship ecosystem that the Hub and its partners have built over previous years and the recovery community here in Sada County and abroad. And we've been privileged to pilot some interesting and exciting new programs and events such as this one. So I'm excited to see how it turns out tonight. We've got a local speaker here with us, Dale King. I'll say more about him in a minute. Uh, Amy Pulver from Xenia, Ohio. I'll say more about her as well. And then our keynote speaker who will be joining us virtually uh, for our final presentation this evening before we all ship out for the night, Michael Brady Wade. So we're going to hear some exciting stuff about the power of entrepreneurship and how that can revitalize Appalachian communities. We're going to hear about the social and emotional impact of recovery community organizations and the potential value that that could have for us here. And we're going to hear about the recovery-inspired value of authentic leadership. We've got food in the back. I don't know if you've got any yet, but feel free at any point, make your way back there, grab some food, coffee, refreshments. Seriously, if there's food there, when this event is over, take it home with you, okay? Because I don't want to have to. All right, you're welcome to do that at any point. Just try to be quiet with it, okay? I'm going to pass the mic over to our program director, David Kilroy, who's going to talk for a few minutes about the overall vision and mission of the Hub here. I would be remiss if I didn't say that none of us would be sitting in this room right now if it weren't for the visionary leadership of David. It's been a privilege to work with him. So enjoy the evening, all right? David, come on up. Thank you, Josh. Um, so I am going to, to keep this brief. Uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, kidding you. Part of the reason I'm up here is just to make sure the slides work. So of course, I want to start off by thanking our sponsors uh, for making this event possible. So my name is David Kilroy. I'm the program director for the Cricket Innovation Hub. And like Josh mentioned, uh, part of our mission as the Entrepreneurship Center for the University is to be a bridge between campus and community. Uh, a couple of years ago, Shawnee State received a grant from the Appalachian Regional Commission, and that expanded the mission of what we're doing to not just be a bridge and build bridges, but to really build those bridges between a broad regional entrepreneurship ecosystem and the recovery community in, in all of those places. So we have partners throughout the region, uh, business incubators, entrepreneurship programs, maker spaces like wood shops, metal shops, uh, anything you can imagine. And part of what we've been doing over the past couple of years is trying to make those spaces, those programs, more accessible and more inclusive of people in recovery. So there's a lot of value there. Uh, it's not done yet. This is just the beginning. You know, this is just a couple of years. It takes a lot longer than that, and I think we all know that. So like I said, I am going to be brief here. There's not a whole lot to say beyond what Josh has already said. We've got three great speakers here. Uh, if you've not been to one of our Entrepreneurial Journey Speaker Series before, this is the first one we've held, uh, obviously, in a couple of years. So we're really excited that it's back. One of the great things about these programs is the opportunity for Q&A discussion after each speaker. These guys are going to talk about stuff they're really passionate about. It would be great to have some, some quality Q&A discussion afterwards, so keep that in mind. Uh, with that, I think I'm going to pass it back to Josh, who's going to introduce our first speaker. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. All right. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. All right. First up, we have Dale King. Dale is a nationally recognized speaker, entrepreneur, veteran, CrossFit coach, and proud son of Portsmouth, Ohio. Dale served in the U.S. Army, deploying twice in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom 3 and 4. Upon leaving the military, he returned home to open PSKC CrossFit. 2010 to build a stronger community among those who have been ravaged by a depressed economy and opioid addiction in our community. He went on to co-found the nonprofit team Some Assembly Required, as well as Doc Spartan, which is an all-natural grooming and skincare company in 2015. Doc Spartan, you might recall, made its way to national TV by appearing in season eight of ABC's Shark Tank, eventually landing a deal with Robert Herzebeck. In 2019, Dale and the staff at PSKC partnered with the Counseling Center to pioneer an experimental program that incorporates fitness as a force multiplier to addiction treatment. And as recently as two weeks ago, 
launched a pilot program called the Portsmouth Method, which I personally am quite excited to hear more about tonight. So without further ado, Dale, the stage is yours. Thank you, Josh. Uh, thank you for everybody coming today. Uh, real quick, who here is in is in treatment right now? Awesome, awesome. Give those guys a round of applause. <laughs> who here is actually here just because you're trying to get out of the house? That's, come on, raise hands. That's fine. All right, good. All right. <laughs> I'll try to make this uh, try to make this worth your while. Uh, thanks again, Josh, for the for the introduction. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, behind me, this is headline circa 2010, 11, 12. And I'll let you guys kind of see that, read through that. This is what I return to coming back from Iraq. I was born and raised here in Portsmouth, Ohio, 99 grad of, of PHS. I was gone for about a decade, uh, the military and college, and was fortunate enough to be able to come back home. <laughs> What I did recognize is what I came back home to, right? I can understand Baghdad, I can understand Mosul, and I know those cities and I can appreciate that. I couldn't understand what had happened here, how it happened and why it happened, right? Um, so like any good intel officer, I kind of want to understand and try to figure out and know my enemy, right? So how did we get to where we are now, and especially you know, in, the, in the 2010, 12, 13, 14, 15 time frame, all right? Well, oxys, right? Oxys is how we got there. Who made the oxys? Purdue Pharma, led by the Sackler family. And how was it so easy, right? Well, anybody will buy hope in a model, especially if it's non-addictive. Right? You're feeling pain, something's wrong. Next thing you know, you got the magic bullet that will cure all your physical ailments. Now, they're smart too, right? So they target specific areas to where that population's in need. Economic development's decreasing, got nothing else to do. Well, when steel mills start closing down, an easy fix is pill mills. Right now, I don't know if you know the history of this area specifically, but Portsmouth, Ohio is home to the creation of the pill mill business model. Scripts for cash. It actually happened right across, right across the river. All right? Well, ran into a little problem. Turns out, Oxycontin is addictive. Right? And it only started getting a little trouble when, when folks started dying. So what, what does the Sackler family do? It's actually a brilliant strategy. We're not to blame. The abuser, the addict, is at fault. They are clearly the culprits in the problem. They, my friends, are the reckless criminals responsible for the opioid epidemic. All right? Uh, and warfare, a uh, component of that is psychological operations. This is one of the most brilliant strategies you could have operated from. It's not our fault. It's not the physician's fault prescribing it. It's not the pill mill guys who started here and then quickly proliferated up and down Appalachia. Sure as hell, it's not the FDA who approved that less than 1% is addictive, it has to be you guys who's responsible, right? And so from this strategy, it leads to this, right? And I apologize for my language, and Amanda's here, she's got little ones, but she also knows me, so uh, if we got ear muffle, we will, right? Addicts are shitbag junkies. Kind of small, but that's me, circa 2000, 2017. That's my quote. That's what I thought. That's what I was being led to believe. And that's why the decline of Portsmouth, that's why property values are going down. It's 
because addicts are shitbag junkies who can't get their life together. I mean, after all, it's Hammer the Abuser. It's clearly, it's clearly your fault, right? Well, that gets into another, another issue. So when finally we started clamping down on pill mills and oxys, started putting, clamping that valve down, what happened? We now have a population that was highly addicted to opioids without access to, to them. So what do you do? You use heroin. Okay? So now heroin starts coming in. This is all you know detailed laid out in, in Sam's book, Dreamland, and, and later on in his follow-on book. So heroin starts coming in. Well now we got something better than heroin. We got fentanyl. The problem started with a billionaire. If you look at like watch Marvel movies and, and Star Wars, you think about the most evil antagonist villains out there. Like you couldn't write more than a billionaire family who's like wants profit for blood. But now we have China in collusion with cartels to pump more fentanyl in here. And oh by the way. You're not going to apprehend trucks crossing the border because with a, a 15 pound backpack full of fentanyl, you can wipe out the entire Midwest. Right? The amount of fentanyl compared to heroin, compared to Oxycontin, it's literally sprinkles. So we got it coming from China. You know, you go on the dark web, order it right away. But more than likely, you're getting the, the chemical precursor, goes down to Mexico, comes up the border, and the next thing you know, 100,000 people a year are dying. But it's the addict's fault, right? <clears throat> Billionaire family got us all addicted, got us on heroin, and now, now we've got China in collusion with cartels for a cheaper, more potent weapon to be used against us. So what are we going to do from here? I mean, if you look at it just from a business standpoint, my all-in cost of goods is $810, and I can flip that to 800 grand. I mean, that's, that's a hell of a margin people are making. It's a hell of a margin people are making on you. People making on us, right? So, <clears throat> current situation. Raise your hand if you know somebody that's overdosed. Raise your hand if you've overdosed yourself. Right? So here we are. This is coming from a report issued this month. Since 1999, estimated more than 1 million Americans have died. I mean, that's, let that sink in. In over 20 years, 1 million Americans have died. If you take out the Civil War, that's more than any people, U.S. men and women servicemen, have died in battles overseas. Combined. In 20 years, we've lost 1 million Americans to them. Now, if you put an economic cost on that, that $1 million, or that 1 million people leads to a negative impact of one trillion. One million people, one trillion dollars in negative impact. And here we are still to this day and we're fighting a stigma that it's your fault. And I'm here to say you do have a personal responsibility in this. This does not absolve you of the decision you've made but we need to understand how it started. If we don't know our enemy, we can't fight our enemy. Furthermore, we're losing this war. Just by the amount of hands that went up and just by the, the facts back here, we're losing this war. Because we're trying to fight a conventional enemy with conventional methods. Well, when you're up against a more motivated, better equipped, better funded enemy, you don't go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. You fight in unconventional warfare. All right? So this is what we did in Iraq. 
And on, on the left here, right, you have a cool little graphic I ripped off from a manual. We're talking unconventional warfare or irregular warfare. So the way this works is the main focus here is we want to build up an indigenous resistance to take on the enemy. All right, we're not going to fight. We don't have tanks. We don't have bomb, or we don't have fighter pilots. We don't have everything the enemy has, but we've got people. So the special forces team, their job is to take 12 guys, deploy to a foreign country, and then be a force multiplier to 5,000, right? Just by a 12, 12 person element. And what we're trying to eventually do is raise up a host nation force that's competent, that's capable, that's committed to take on and stand up security for their own for their own country. All right. So this is the lessons that were kind of fresh in my head when I when I moved back. <clears throat> and I didn't know shit about business, right? Um, I was working for the Department of Energy at the time, but I love working out and I love CrossFit, and I and I could see tangibly what fitness can do to increase somebody's capability and confidence, right? So that's how the gym started in, in 2010. In a, in a, was probably an illegal warehouse. Uh, and the things that we were doing were probably illegal at the time. Um, but it worked, right? So our, our initial tagline at the time was, pain is not my enemy, it is my call of greatness. So we want to teach people through physical stress to show them that they can overcome that. Right? So from there, there'd be, there'd be all kinds of stuff that, that would go on. Uh, from inside the gym, we opened up another company called Doc Spartan. We were fortunate enough uh, to go on Shark Tank, get a deal. Um, came back in around 2018. A friend of mine who was working out at the gym was in recovery, and he saw how important CrossFit was to his own individual recovery. So he's like, hey, man. I work for the counseling center. I want to find a way to get CrossFit to clients. I think it would be tremendous, right? So in 2018, if we go back a couple slides, right? This is my attitude. Why? Because I hadn't bothered to talk to anybody in recovery. Because I was better than them. I mean, that was my attitude. Right? And this is what we're facing now, you know, based upon that PSYOP campaign, essentially. That's what created stigma, right? Well, what happened was I started to develop relationships. I got to know people on a first name basis, understand their struggles, what they were going through. 2018, our first group got done. There's a guy named Andrew. He was done with his 90 day inpatient treatment. I was fired up for him because he was done, and I thought he's off the greener pastures. So I said, hey, man, where are you going after this? Thinking he's got a job and somewhere to go and lined up. He's like, well, man, I'm going to the homeless shop. Because if I go back home, I know I'm going to relapse. I was like, shit. I didn't even know where the homeless shelter was. So I said, hey, dude. Come tomorrow, I'll give you a broom and a mop. We'll find something for you to do. That was 2018. Andrew now has his car. He's got his own apartment. He's actually enrolled here, uh, getting a business degree. And he's got he's a coach at, for me and for the gym. And he's role model. Role model. And he's a mentor. So if you go back and you're training up an indigenous resistance force. That's the model that that looks like. Here's what an indigenous resistance force looks like. To the normal public, they're pillbillies, welfare queens, felons, thieves, addicts, junkies, scumbags, degenerate. However, Given enough time, training, love, support, and appreciation, they become coaches, they become managers, they become students, mentors, they reclaim their life, they reclaim their confidence, they reclaim their capability. 
It's not given. It's fucking earned. And that's what you guys got to understand. You can get there. It's going to take time. It's going to take effort. And it's going to, in, in the private sector, has a lot to be involved with that. People oftentimes use drugs due to some sort of trauma, which leads to isolation. Community kills isolation. Strength kills weakness. You need both. I mean, it doesn't have to be CrossFit. It needs to be something that you do every day that you are proud of. That you're proud of achieving. You gotta be competent, you gotta be capable, you gotta be committed. Well, from there, and you need to have an attitude that no one is coming. No matter who's in office, no matter what nonprofit, no matter, there's not gonna be a magical factory that's gonna open here and give people jobs. No one is coming to save you. You've got to be willing to save yourself. It's up to us. No one gives a shit about Portsmouth. Except for the people that live here. Which leads us to the Portsmouth method. Alright? So this is, I'm getting towards the end here. It's going to sound all cool. Like I had all this planned and packaged. I didn't know shit about shit. Right? I didn't know how to run a gym. I didn't know how to run a business. I didn't know any of that. <clears throat> but I knew there was good people here and you could build, you can manufacture, and you can export things out of course of Ohio. And the, and the two things you need to have, you need to have good people, which we've got plenty of. You gotta have a little bit of creativity. All right, so the gym led to Doc Spartan led back to the gym again when we started working with the counseling center. And then what we found out is people in recovery can't get a job, right? Because it's not very welcoming to hire felons most of the time, all right? And then when I go to set up y'all's pay stubs, you don't even have a bank, right? Nor an ID half the time. That's just the, that's the facts of the matter. And you know what? Who gives a shit, right? We can work through that stuff. So this is where this is where business owners have to take some responsibility because at this point we got two options: continue the narrative that you guys are shitbags and scumbags and the, and the reason for all the decline, and let alone do nothing about it. Or you can get in the game. We can scrap a little bit and we can fight. And we're not going to win every time, but we're going to win. We're going to. We're going to get our fair share, right? So, started with one guy, now at Doc Spartan, across three companies now, we, we're fortunate enough to hire 12 people in recovery, three of whom of which are CrossFit coaches. And then during the pandemic, <clears throat> reached out to a guy, you've got to be able to see opportunities in the middle of chaos. So, reached out to a guy to start making kettlebells here in Portsmouth, made at OSCO which was awesome, and then Osco realized they needed somebody to package these kettlebells. So they reached back out to me, so we stood up a company in the middle of uh, the middle of pandemic, and that's Sarah, and that's the kettlebells on the left. So now, the same tools they use in the gym, now they're able to get employed, packaging them, sending them along the way. And in closing, you got two options. You can do nothing, or you can fucking help somebody. That's it. You have to decide what your legacy is going to be, how you want to be remembered during the worst, deadliest health crisis in American history. Will you be known for doing something about it, or just blaming the addict? Thank you, guys.
Uh, Dale, thank you. Uh, I'll start off the questions here, and then I'm going to walk around and, and pass the mic around. So think of a question. Dale, what's next? That's the question. Huh. What's next for PSKC? What's next for Dr. Spartan? Yeah, next so th Jeff? this goes back to Josh. So the Forceful Method. So, uh, so Max. I'm Adam Draper. I'm a fourth generation venture capitalist. I run an accelerator called Boost VC. Well, okay, how do we do this in our town? Right? So we came up. With what we're doing, we're doing like monthly seminars. We're calling it the Fourth Method. So actually, we've got another one next week. So we invite CrossFit gym owners and members from behavioral health centers or agencies to come down for a full day. And what we do is we explain what we're doing from a big picture, and then we it's mandatory they participate in a workout at the Health and Wellness Center. Then Max talks to them afterwards about what substance use disorder is, you know, how addiction plays with the brain on the, on the science side of it. Then I'll talk to them about the CrossFit coaching philosophy and then give them tools on how to develop a business relationship with their local neighboring uh, behavioral health center. And then they go home, hopefully they establish contact, and then we continue to work and mentor with them on the side to build that program up. So the eventual goal is we're going to take what used to be known as the pill mill capital of, the, of America and now we're going to place that with portion of So teach them what worked here to go in their own communities and, and try to make a difference. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, man. So I had a question about, I saw, was that Ricky on the short tank? That, that, that? Was that you? That was me. Yeah. That yeah. was you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> who bought who bought into that? So we uh, our investor is the far guy on the right, Robert Hershbeck. Okay. Yeah. He went on to he later called us one of the most successful deals he's ever had awesome. in, in, in the T V show. And uh, he's still an active investor today in the company. Nice. Yeah. question is what who do I talk to or contact about ideas and things that I might have that might that y'all might be interested in or something uh, just from a an entrepreneur business aspect or what what question specifically I guess just want to be just somebody that wants to get involved okay and somebody that wants to be a part of what you're doing um, I like I, mean, I have a lot of ideas a lot of things that I think might help with this recovery process, like therapeutic things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, hit me up on Instagram. I mean, that's, uh, that's the easiest way, right? So, uh, all right, I'll give you my number when I'm, when I'm done here. Okay, thank we'll you. Look it up, yeah, man. Yeah, because I'm not a big Facebook Instagram. Oh, yeah, no problem, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm an old man. <laughs> Josh is also a good person to hit up. Okay. Just FYI. Thank you. All right, who's next? All the way back in the corner. <laughs> I'm Paul Maddox. Uh, I just want to say thanks for sharing your story. And uh, I lived in Portsmouth through the pill mills with uh, Dr. Lilly. You know, and uh, I mean, I don't know if I was allowed to say the name, but I'm sorry. <laughs> I think mean, at this point, it's all public records. Yeah, Dr. Yeah. Proctor, you know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, man, I, just, I went through a lot of, you know, seen them a lot, dealt with them a lot, and you know, I'd say that's how it all got started down here. You know what I mean? But uh, with that, I pass. Thank you. Yeah, man. Thank you. Hi, Dale. Um, thank you so much for sharing your story and. Um, I just was kind of curious about the Doc Spartan. Uh, how do you distribute that? Is it something that people order online, or do you have it available at your gym, or do you, you know, take it out to other locations? So, 80-ish uh, percent of our sales are all online. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 
how we're able to provide as many jobs as possible is we make we make fulfill and distribute everything ourselves. So that way uh, we don't work through a co-packer or a third party. We we make everything ourselves. And um, right now it's it's primarily our biggest channel is our website. We're also on Amazon. And then we have some in, like probably a couple hundred independent retailers across the country, like pump pop shops. Um, you know, the big big goal is eventually to try to land a bigger retail retail partner for that. And your experience being a second chance employer, uh, what do you find unique about these uh, individuals in recovery that yeah. you hire? So um, that's a great question, and yeah, you know, it seems. The majority of the audience here is, is folks in recovery. And I can tell you from an employer, it's one of the most challenging, stressful, what other adjectives I can throw in there. Um, but it's the single most fulfilling and rewarding thing we've ever done. And I wouldn't ever change it. Because to me, it's like, uh, I'm all for making as much money as possible, but that pales in comparison to watching somebody grow and develop and reclaim their life. One of my favorite stories ever is we got one of those guys, his name's Ricky. Uh, when he first started working, this is around Christmas time a couple years ago. So he starts working, great guy, great employee. We give him his first check. It's like a week before Christmas. He, he comes back to the conference room, takes his check out of his pocket, opens it up in front of us, and I'm thinking, oh shit, did we not like pay him as much as he should? Like, what's going on? And he said, I just want to thank you guys. This is the first time in my life I can buy my kids Christmas present. So I'll take that any day to handle all the stress, and but. You know, from a from a tactical side, it's just you gotta you gotta be. Uh, we tell all our guys, look, your recovery is first. So you gotta go to your you gotta go to your appointments. You gotta go to your counseling sessions. We will work around that, but you also have an a obligation to us communication and let us know when things aren't going right, so we can help and step in. Um, so it's challenging, but it's the most rewarding thing we've ever done. Andrew, uh, I just want to say thanks for your service, by the way. Oh, thanks, man. And uh, you're really inspiring, man. Right? So, you know, I'm from out of, out of the city. It's so very special to me. Yeah. Uh, this is a huge challenge. I'm 48 years old. You brought me to tears. So, I want to say I appreciate taking the stigma away from the treatment and the, the whole process. It's, it's tough. Yeah. It's always, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. No, man, thank you. Thank you. And I think that's the biggest thing is uh, don't be afraid of what you've done. you got to own that shit. Like we, uh, fortunately, I'm, I'm not in recovery. I you know, have a bunch of other shit wrong with me, but that's not, that's not one of them. But um, we collectively call ourselves scumbags and degenerates. You know, I've done shit in my life that I'm not proud of, right? But works. Take back that term. You know what I mean? Don't try to escape that. Use that as fuel to to be a better man and live a better life. Um, so take as much as you can. Understand understand your scars where they come from, but your scars. Scars on our roadmap for the future. They're just a reminder of what happened in the past. You know what I mean? Yeah. Much appreciated, man. Yeah, brother. Thank you. Time for one last question. All right. Hello, my name is George. Hey, bud. I just wanted to ask what your religious belief is. Uh, I believe in Jesus, but I also cuss a lot. 
<laughs> that that would be my, that would be my philosophy in RV. Yeah, and, I mean, what? Thank you for asking that, right? So, um, it's not something I ever am public about or whatever, because I think you can, you your faith should live by your acts, right? So, um, thank you for asking that. I was waiting for somebody to ask about those shorts, though. You know? Why are you going to wear those tonight, man? It's cold. I heard it was a speedo. Right on. All right. Well, thank you so much, Daryl. Thank you so much for all those comments, questions. Let's keep them coming, okay? Next up is Amy Paulvin. Amy is the executive director of The Hope Spot, which is a recovery community organization in Xenia, Ohio, that was formed in 2015. The Hope Spot offers a safe place for members of the recovery community in their area to meet and take part in programs and services that are beneficial for long-term recovery. So I'm really excited to hear about the impact of Amy's story and the folks that she works with in Xenia. Amy, come on up. It's all yours. I just found out last Tuesday um, that I'd be here, and I was like, oh, two TED Talkers and me. So, um, but the gist I got from what we were supposed to do up here was kind of promote the idea of uh, people who don't know what they're doing and doing it anyway. So that's uh, kind of me. Uh, I don't have a, I speak to different audiences, and if I over-prepare too much, um, I'm not as good. So typically all I do is just pray that um, I say something that God needs somebody here to say, to hear. So I hope that um, that happens this evening. Um, one thing I'm going to read real quick is just that uh, recovery is necessary for community success and community is necessary for recovery. Um, I'm going to tell you a little quick story about me. I'm uh, a child of an alcoholic. I grew up in an alcoholic home. Um, Dad worked hard, played hard. I'm the youngest of six kids, and I'm the youngest by 13 years. Uh, my oldest brother's 18 years older than me, and my youngest is 13 years older than me. Uh, my family comes from uh, down in Kentucky, and uh, you know, we grew up in, and no one was ever encouraged to leave home. So uh, my brothers, while they're partying in the 80s, uh, are drinking and snorting coke. And so basically I grew up with, uh, you know, a lot of addicts and alcoholics in the, in the house. So anyway, I, I, I grew up and I, and I knew, we, we lived in suburbia, uh, Beaver Creek. Uh, I'm from the Dayton area. Beaver Creek is where Wright Patterson Air Force Base is. And um, I was exposed to a lot of typical life. And, and I knew that our family wasn't typical. Um, and so from a very, very young age, my goal and my only dream in life was to uh, get married, have kids, and do this the right way. And um, so I would grow up and I would marry uh, my best friend, just a, a, a really great guy, incredibly funny, um, and he didn't drink. Um, yeah, he smoked a little bit of weed, but uh, he, he did so in a real functional, out in the garage kind of way and held down a full-time job and was very successful and, uh, you know, whatnot. But to me, especially in, in, in the early 2000s, uh, smoking wasn't anything compared to what alcohol uh, could do to a life. So I'm living the dream. My husband uh, is able to provide enough income for me that I'm allowed to be a stay-at-home mom and I'm allowed to raise my girls. I have two little girls. Um, my oldest was born in 2002. Her name is Reese. And then my youngest is born in 2005. Her name is Marin. Uh, Marin was born with Down syndrome and uh, that was kind of something that was um, unexpected. Uh, kind of floored us, um, but we embraced it. 
and I was able to find a community of other parents who uh, were had children with Down syndrome, and um, that community was really important to me, and it got me through a lot of hard years, helped me be able to raise my daughter better, um, and so on. So I'm, I'm, I'm raising our girls, my husband's providing, life is good. You know, winter of 2007, though, my husband um, burns his hand at work, lays his hand on an exhaust pipe, uh, gets a uh, severe burn, goes to the hospital, gets prescribed Vicodin, and to be honest, I don't really even remember a whole lot about it. You know, it wasn't anything major. Um, what would occur, though, is, you know, he took one Vicodin, he told me, didn't take any of the pain away, and he took two Vicodins, and he didn't have a problem in the world. And my husband was a type 1 diabetic, had a close, tight relationship with our uh, doctor, and was able to manipulate our doctor into a couple of other scripts. And then due to the pill mills, uh, his secretary's grandma got prescribed a boatload of Percocets. And so he starts buying Percocets from her. And then a subcontractor that he worked with uh, was prescribed methadone for a back injury. I was in denial of my husband's addiction for about two years. And um, when I finally figured out what was going on, this was, you know, 2008, 2009, the economy's tanked, a lot of things are going on, we'd ultimately lose, we had a rental property that was our first house, we'd lose it, we'd lose um, the home, our family home that we lived in. Uh, but I remember my husband finally told me, he said, babe, I'm addicted to pills. And, and as a family member, I, I remember distinctly putting on my super cape, because I know it's probably is now, and I'm going to fix it. And um, we both had a whole lot to learn about addiction. You know, we really thought that you, you go to treatment, you get the drugs out of your system, and then you just go back to being normal, you know? And then all he's got to do is get a good job, and this is just going to be a bump in our road. Um, and, and, and we would learn real quick, particularly with opiate addiction, that that's not how it goes. Um, and my husband would, uh, he, he continued to struggle. And, and I knew I was going crazy, you know, trying to force solutions, trying to babysitting, uh, trying to manage, and, manage, fix, and control everything, you know. So I ended up finding a community for me. I ended up going to Naranon, or Al-Anon, and uh, I got a lot of help. I, I learned uh, a lot about myself in that program. And uh, meanwhile, my husband's going to N.A., um, but there were some differences between alcoholism and opiate addiction. Um, you know, as a family member, we are scared to death of overdose, uh, our financial, the stigma. And, and I had this um, urge, there was another fellowship called Naranon, which is a sister to NA. Uh, it's for family members. And, and I remember I was working at our church at the time, and I was a facilities assistant, and so I knew that I had space. And for me, I had this kind of God nag going on. Um, and, I, and I kept thinking, because there wasn't any Narnons in Dayton. And I was like, you know, Dayton's a big enough town. There's somebody better than me, more equipped than me to start one. Um, but for me, eventually, I, I just started one. And that was another community for me. Um, I'd start speaking at a local treatment center at family nights, sharing with family members, trying to encourage them to get help for themselves. You know, because not for anything, it's not just always the addicts and alcoholics who are sick. <laughs> and uh, believe me, I had some sickness about me. So uh, that got me kind of into the community. You know, I'd go and speak. Um, I'd speak at this treatment center my husband went to. He'd gone there a couple of times. Uh, his recovery was a roller coaster. You know, he, he, he struggled with anything. He struggled with Suboxone. Um, and then, unfortunately, much to my su surprise, in 2014, I'd wake up one evening after falling asleep on the couch and find my husband dead in the kitchen. Uh, he died of a fentanyl overdose. And this was before fentanyl was what it is today. This was old school, you gotta grind up a patch and snort it. And um, it just shook my life. <clears throat> 
you know, I lost a lot of my identity at that time. Um, we'd uh, lose my brother three months later to heroin. And um, November of that year, the manager of the treatment center that I would speak to, to speak at, contacted me because there was a grant coming down through the state of Ohio for a recovery community organization. And he was charged with getting some people who were passionate about recovery together. So he invited me to a meeting. And I went to this meeting and, um, you know, I just kept going to the meetings, kept going to the meetings, and eventually was down to just a few of us, and um, we formed this nonprofit called the Hope Spot. Uh, we opened our doors in um, July of 2015, and I'm going to go ahead and play a little video now, tell you a little bit, show you a little bit about the impact that the uh, Hope Spot has had on our community. Um, I, I will share that when I got there, again, going, I'm suburban mom, and, uh, and now I'm running a, a uh, nonprofit with uh, a bunch of addicts, and I didn't really think I was going to fit in too much. And uh, one of the cool things is, is that uh, this is my community, and, and I love these folks. So what's also cool is that we didn't start making this video until <laughs> 9.15 last night. <laughs> but if you work with uh, recovering addicts and alcoholics, we can get stuff done, you know, because <laughs> sleep isn't as important to us as it is to normies, and, uh, you know, it's it just one of those things that, I, that we love doing. So I'm going to go ahead and sh show you guys the video. Uh, I'm here from 7.30 until 6 in the morning, 
and I'd say 90% of the, the 12 step meetings I attend are during the day at the Hope Spot. Um, Amy holds recovery events. Um, Hope Spot's just involved with everything. And, I started going to the host spot when I got out of the Christopher house and uh, I started going to meetings there and uh, now I currently meet with my sponsor there every week to do step work. It's given us a, a safe place to go and to be able to talk about everything that I, I'm going through and help me get through my process. Uh, I've also watched help many people that uh, just needed somewhere to go and, and some people to talk to. It's a really good place. I think it's uh, great to have a couple of community out here and uh, I'd love to see it you know, keep going. For me, man, is a place that I can go that I know it's a safe place. Um, I know there's meetings there. Um, it's a place where I can meet new people and uh, people who run it are amazing people. Um, also, a place that I can go and meet up with sponsees and do step work. And I know the, the whole spot is an awesome place, man, because for so long I never had no place that I could go that I knew it was a safe place that welcomed me in with open arms. And that's what the hope spot is for me. Um, I know without it, a lot of people would be lost and there wouldn't be a safe place for you know addicts and alcoholics and stuff. So yeah, the hope spot is amazing and I hope it continues to keep going and continues to keep getting better. Thank you. Hello, my name is Troy. I just want to tell you a quick second to uh, let you know what I think about the Hope Spot. Um, since being around, I've seen uh, the Hope Spot help change a lot of people's lives. It's always been a safe place for people to go, um, somewhere they can meet other people in recovery that uh, that can help in return, help kind of guide them in their lives. And, and, uh, and now I actually meet sponsees there to do stuff work myself. Um, and I've seen lives transform there and, and a lot of people grow bonds and, and not to mention all the meetings that go on throughout the week that uh, help give people a, a hope shot. That's really what it is, it's a hope shot. It's a good place in such uh, a negative world right now. It's a good place to hang out with good people and, and positive, uh, positive mindsets and, and just, just a lot of good. And that's something that I'm grateful to uh, be able to witness. Thank you. Hi, my name's Joe Lamb. Uh, how the Hope Spot has impacted my life has been outstanding, really. You know, um, I've been able to uh, go there and meet with my sponsor on a weekly basis to do my step work. And uh, now, after you know a year being clean and having sponsees myself, I'm able to go there at any time I need to to uh, do step work with my sponsees. So it's been a it's been a great experience. Hey guys, I'm Travis and I am a recovering alcoholic. I just want to take a moment out of my day to uh, talk to you about the Hope Spot. I started going to the Hope Spot uh, when I was in treatment back in August of uh, 2021 and it was a place for me to uh, feel integrated with uh, the AA community. I do work the program of Alcoholics Anonymous um, so the Hope Spot has been a big part in my journey so far. Um, they host a lot of meetings there uh, which I'm very grateful for as well as um, it's a safe place for me to be able to meet my sponsor and do my step work. I know there's a lot of people in the community as well. They don't have a safe place or say they were to be triggered, meaning to uh, meet with people in the community who are sober, some sober support, they'll be able to go out and meet them there. It's a safe place for everybody to uh, kind of go to and be around like-minded people um, to maintain long-term sobriety.
Recovery community organizations are uh, definitely underestimated, uh, undervalued at times, and underfunded. But in reality, they're a vital, essential part of a recovery community. And once that you, you, you experience an RCO in your community, and you start talking to the people that are in your treatment center or in your recovery groups or wherever they would be about the difference this RCO made in their life, um, it's just an amazing journey. Uh, people come and say, you know, I didn't know where to start. They showed me. I didn't know my options. They showed me. I didn't know how to, to, I had no place to live. I had no food to eat. I had no insurance. They helped connect me. You know, uh, they didn't judge me. I, I went to go see it. I saw this recovery life that I never thought possible, modeled by other people. Non-judgmentally, they helped me find my own pathway to recovery. And we were able to meet towards common goals. A place where I can be accepted and not judged for my past. It's something really huge, you know, uh, where nothing's expected in return. You know, uh, and it, it's, it's really important because we are the boots on the ground. We are doing outreach, advocacy, reducing stigma. Uh, we are out there showing people that there's hope. We inspire. Uh, we get the community involved in, in, in our projects, in our activities, um, in our rallies, in our events. You know, it, it really makes a difference in someone's life when they think, well, I'm all alone. I'm an alcoholic, I'm an addict, I have an SPD disorder, I, I, I don't know what to do. And then all of a sudden they open a the door to a world where people are living productive lives and found a new way to live that have found a way and coping skills to deal with all this stuff and be successful. And not only successful, but happy. And, and when someone sees that, um, and they see that working, it's a lot easier for them to start saying, okay, what are those options for treatment again in my area? Residential or outpatient or whatever. Where can I get an assessment today? Uh, are there beds open somewhere in Ohio today? Um, uh, is there, what's all the recovery housing in the area? Well, can we call it all? And that's something that a normal treatment center won't do. Um, they're they're going to they're gonna navigate you to their treatment, um, to their favorite places that will return their their customers most of the time, um, and, and we can just go ahead. We're not, there's no connections. We can go ahead and help people meet them where they're at, walk hand in hand through the process, and uh, let them see us thrive, and then we get to watch see them thrive. It's an amazing experience. I would trade for the world. The recovery community organization saved my life and the lives of so many people I know. Uh, if there wasn't an RCO in my community, I do not think I would be sober today. I don't think I would be clean today. I don't think where I'd be where I'm at today. Professionally, spiritually, emotionally, physically, um, and um, I'm just so thankful for freedom. And I found freedom through an RCO. second chance employer. Um, he's been clean about five years. Uh, he has a construction business. He hires uh, people in recovery. Uh, we take uh, recovery really seriously at our, at our, and I think you might have picked up with that theme. You know, we, we, we work together. We work steps. Uh, we're a many pathways organization. And so we do a lot of linkage to treatment, a lot of linkage, again, if you're looking for something face-to-face, -face, we'll, we'll link you up there, we'll, we'll do what you need. We meet people, same thing, where, the, where they're at. Um, we never know when somebody walks through the door what they need. We help people get their license, their birth certificates, get reestablished, get jobs, resumes, you know, just pretty much anything. Um, and uh, I, I just love what we do. And we, we work with a lot, um, I've had to grow a whole lot, you know, working with our, our public health. Uh, we're a Narcan distributor now. Um, we're able to pass out Narcan, where we work, um, I'm the chair of the Green County Drug-Free Coalition. 
Um, I don't have a lot of letters behind my name. And um, what I've learned, and, and for a long time that stuck with me, you know, it was, it was hard for me to overcome. Uh, and I kept on saying, I'm not good enough, but this stuff needs to get done and nobody else is doing it. So definitely if you're an entrepreneur, if you're an average person, if you're a mom or somebody who's lost somebody, if you're an addict in recovery, if you're an alcoholic in recovery, you can make a difference in your community. Um, the, the, the cool thing about Green County that I'm real excited about, I'll tell you about another organization that I'm on their board, it's called Emerge Recovery and Trade. And the cool thing about Emerge is we are going to be having trade schools for people in recovery. Because one of our goals too is to be able to get people employment that gives them a livable, a beyond just a livable wage. And again, there's times that you know people have felonies, they've got, you know, they, they don't have skill sets necessarily. So we've got, um, we're gonna have a HVAC, plumbing, um, roofing, digital marketing, all these trade schools, and it's gonna be a residential trade school where you live on campus there. Uh, we've had three guys uh, that were all second chance employers. One owned a plumbing company, one owned a HVAC company, and one owned a roofing company. And a few years ago, our uh, career center built a new career center, and so our old one went up for sale. And within three days, these guys, this was not some big plan. Uh, they made a decision in, in three days to uh, go in and, and make this huge investment, and um, it, it's just incredible. And so I see average people make positive changes in their community, impact our community, and um, I just would encourage you to, to do the same. One last little plug um, of, of another aspect of community. You know, when my husband died uh, raising my kids, uh, I learned that, you know, that, that's another huge fallout of the opiate epidemic is all these, is, is grief. You know, my kids would go to, i take my different, my kids to therapists. I, I would see that our school counselors who were guidance counselors are now grief counselors and they're not prepared. I'd see my friends who work in the addiction field losing clients over and over again. And, and to me, grief is, is very much like addiction. As a society, we don't know how to talk about it. Uh, and again, we kind of have that same viewpoint of like, just get over it, you know. And so um, this coming March, we're going to be having a, I've, I've been working on this for four years, it got postponed because of COVID, but we're bringing in one of the leading grief educators in the country. His name's Dr. Alan Wolfell. We're bringing him in for, um, uh, from Colorado. Um, to tell you how audacious my goal was in bringing him in, I was working off a $40,000 budget. It cost $15,000 for his speaking fees. The cool thing about doing things that scare the piss out of you is this year, through grants and blessings from God, you know, our budget is $275,000. It's, it's incredible. So, and, and I owe a lot of it to that big goal of trying to bring Dr. Wolfelt in. Um, this, the, it's a two-day event. The, the first night is for community, and, and it's going to be live streamed, and it's free, and, and that's for all your family members. Uh, the second day is a professionals event. Um, and so if you know people who work in the, in the social work profession, chemical dependency professionals, counselors, or somebody who just is interested in learning, it's very affordable. If you're doing it online, it's 60 bucks. You get six CEUs. Um, and we're going to be talking about complicated grief and grief associated with addiction loss. That also has its own stigma, you know. It, I went to a, a widow's support group and when the lady next to me tells, says that her husband dies of a brain tumor and I say my husband dies of a drug overdose, you know, her husband's character isn't brought into question. And my husband's is. And that's just another huge stigma. I know people who don't have memorial services for their kids because they don't want to answer questions. Suburbia especially is, is just chronically sick with stigma. And, and the problem is those people don't heal, you know? And, and I believe that also a lot of us, you know, uh, develop, we know that grief 
is a precursor to addiction. It's one of the things that kind of can push you into addiction. So I want to pump those two things, and thank you guys for having me. And if anybody's got any questions, I'm happy to help. Questions, comments, for Amy. We've got about five minutes until our break. Our last speaker, yeah. All right. <laughs> Uh, I liked how you opened up earlier when you said uh, not really knowing what you're doing, but doing it anyway. Because, like, I'm in rec I'm in the house right now. And I, I don't really know much about recovery, but I mean, I got a great sponsor, old school, hardcore sponsor. Uh, I got great staff. I mean, and, like when you walk in the house up there, you can feel like love. You know what I mean? You can feel love when you come in up there, man. If it wasn't for that, I'd probably bounce. But uh, I was wanting to see if you would ask our boss man here <laughs> if maybe he could take us to a meeting up there. <laughs> I, I can ask him. I'll, I'll be sure to give him my contact information. <laughs> I think it would be a little hard for him to tell you no than me. <laughs> so that's all. Thank you. Like your sweatshirt, too. Other questions or comments for Amy? Um, I'd just like to say I appreciate you coming. Um, sorry for your loss, um, but it's a good it's it's good to see somebody take those those things that hurt you and, and turn them into things that can help other people. That's really inspiring, and it's re it's really a good thing to see. And I appreciate you doing this and doing what you're doing for your county. Like, like how the people are here doing it for Scioto County. I was also here during the Lily days. So it's, it's just good to see you. It's, it, it makes me feel inspired, like you said, like, he, like, like the addict before me said, to have somebody doing something, even though they don't know what they're doing, I kind of feel like I'm in the same boat. I want to do something to help, but I don't know exactly what to do. So I'm just going to throw myself out there. Um, but I just want to say I appreciate you being here and speaking to us. And, it, and the Hope Spot is a perfect name for, for it because you, you speak hope. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Just do it. Uh, you'll figure it out. One more? We got time for one more. Don't be shy. No? Yeah. Um, yeah, how uh, vital would you say the 12 steps and sponsor is for uh, recovery? I'm a little biased. <laughs> I like that this guy here has an old school sponsor. Um, you know, I think uh, you have disease that talks to you in your own voice. And, uh, you know, I work a program with AA. I have a sponsor, you know, and uh, believe me, I, I can, it, it was hard headed getting in my head because I didn't have a whole lot of consequences, uh, but I still had a problem, you know, and she's, uh, she's helped me on it, so I think it's incredibly vital, and if you would, the common theme over and over and over again here was meeting up at the Hope Spot with my sponsor to go over spot work. It just, uh, you know, you, you can do it. You know, I'm an advocate for many pathways, um, but I do favor a 12-step program of, of being in a fellowship, getting honest, and getting real with yourself. Because I've watched a lot of people, I've, I've lost a lot of people. So, and uh, and, I, and I'll and I'll share with you too. Like this is the the thing I've noticed. If you're a, it it take it'd take the best, you know. It really does take the best. It's funny, like I'll have one jerk that I really don't like, but he's gonna survive. If you're a good hearted guy, you do anything for anybody, you better watch out. Because addiction will get you. Your disease will get you. And um, I can't explain it, but it takes the best of people. So I encourage you, um, it's not fun, but it's worth it, and you're worth it. So would you say that, uh 
to do the 12 steps and get a sponsor in? I would say to do the 12 steps and get a sponsor. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Amy. Can we give a hand? Okay, we have exactly 10 minutes until our final keynote presenter. So run to the bathroom if you want to, grab some more food, and be back here at 6.55 for our last presentation. Don't want to miss it.
So if we could yes, find a way back in and grab a seat. back in here now. I'm going to introduce our keynote presenter for the evening. I'm very, very, very excited to hear what he has to say. Michael Brady Waite, at the age of 23, was a full-blown drug addict. He'd been kicked out of college, fired from his job, and evicted from his apartment. He had no money, no home, and was still in that blood, believed he would be dead by his 30th birthday. But on September 1st, 2002, after running out of options, Fearing death, he checked into rehab, entered recovery, and has been transforming himself every day since. 
Michael's TEDx Nashville YouTube video, which is how I was introduced to his work, called Great Leaders Do What Drug Addicts Do, is the number one talk in the history of TEDx Nashville. It's been viewed by over one million people in 25 plus countries, and it provides insight into his 17 year journey from addiction and near homelessness to successful entrepreneurship. Michael's a recovering addict, acclaimed speaker, Inc. 500 entrepreneur, award winning three time CEO, leadership coach, and the author of Great Leaders Live Like Drug Addicts How to Lead Your Like Your Life Depends on It. His accomplishments include being named the most admired CEO, named to the top 40 under 40, and being recognized by the Nashville Chamber of Commerce as Healthcare Entrepreneur of the Year. Today, Michael's on a mission to teach individuals, organizations, and communities how to lead themselves by living mask-free, a concept that is built on three principles he learned in early recovery, showing leaders how to achieve balance, reclaim energy, and thrive in their work and in their life. So without further ado now, I give you Michael Bradley. Nobody knows how to do it. 
Nobody knows what it is. Nobody knows how to create authentic leaders. Well, I will submit to you that there is one class of people in this world that have a system, and they know how to systematically create authentic leaders. And that's recovery addicts. The number one word associated with an addict and active addiction is a liar. I'm cool with that. I was one. The number one word associated with an addict in recovery is authentic. And every board room, in every leadership coaching session, every leader in the world is trying to figure out how can they get, they get their leaders to be authentic. But they don't have a system. They don't know how. So today I'm going to show you how what I learned for an hour a night in a meeting and a crappy cup of coffee changed my life. How that thing is changing how leaders lead and will change and revolutionize leadership as we know it. And so to be very specific and clear, this is not a point to talk about leadership and this is not just about me overcoming my addiction. I am just want to add a carrying message. This is about how does the system that was created 80 years ago that allows addicts all over the world to transform themselves actually equip the leaders of this world to become truly great. And by the time you're done listening to my presentation, you'll hear how every leader in this world practice what we learn in recovery, they would say 500 hours a year. Time is the most precious resource inside of companies these days. And they hire fancy consultants with Harvard MBAs and say, how can we get more time? And what I carry the message is, you do what drug acts do to recover and you'll save more time than you ever dreamed. So, let's let us set on addiction and how, we, we, how I bring addiction to leadership and vice versa. So this is a picture of me in active addiction. That's a picture of me with my dad. Now as you look at the picture and you see the hideous shirt I'm wearing, you assume I'm wearing this hideous shirt because I'm high, right? But then you see my dad's wearing a hideous shirt and you go, well, can his dad be high? Like, what, what's going on here? And the truth is, I inherited a terrible fashion sense and addiction from my father. He's not high in this picture, though. He just has terrible fashion sense. And so, when I was in active addiction, my dad, so this is like 1999, right? My dad would take me out to breakfast every six weeks. He would say that he just wanted to buy me some food. I knew, especially now that I'm a father, he just wanted to see that his son was still alive. And I would go to breakfast, and when I would go to breakfast, I would do the three things that drug addicts do every single day to stay high. The first thing I would do is I would say yes to something that I could say no to, and I would get high before I would go see my dad. Then when I was at breakfast, did I tell him that I was homeless, that I was throwing up blood? No, I hid my weaknesses. And as a result, I hindered his ability to help me actualize my potential and be a better human being. And then when he started talking about uncomfortable things, like the impact that my addiction was having on the family, and maybe you should go to treatment, I avoided those difficult conversations like the play. These are the three things that addicts do in active addiction to stay high every single day. We say yes to something we can say no to, we hide our weaknesses, and we avoid difficult conversations. And so this is the definition of addiction that I was taught over the years. It's doing the same thing repeatedly despite negative consequences. And I got news for you. Addicts are not the only people doing something repeatedly that has negative consequences. Leaders do too. But let's go ahead and see what you guys have in common with an addict. For those of you that are not in recovery, but everybody please stand up. I can see you. There's a camera on you, so like I actually can see you. Saying, Thank you very much. I didn't want to have to come over there. It would be like a long run. Alright. I'm going to ask you guys three questions. And I ask this for every company that I go work with. And when you answer yes to just one of those questions, go ahead and sit down. Question number one. In the last 30 days, have you said yes to something that you could say no to? If you have, sit down. I said yes to drugs, but maybe if you're not an addict, you said yes to unnecessary meetings, unnecessary projects, emails that aren't worth your time, calls that aren't worth your time, social media. Wait, you guys, I have two more questions. You're screwing up my whole presentation here. <laughs> so, next question would have been in the last 30 days if you hit a weakness. Most leaders are scared to say, I don't know. And the last 
especially with been the last 30 days, would be a very difficult conversation. Number one, difficult conversation avoided in business is performance management. Number two is setting expectations for customers. The point is, I do this talk for groups of 20, 200, and 2,000, and I ask three simple questions. When I'm asking, do you do the things that I do in active addiction? And even in the audiences of 2,000, everybody's seated when I'm done. And that is the opportunity in leadership that only a recovering addict could see. All right, guys, I had to extend that. So here's an example of what I'm talking about. This is Scott McAllister. He's the CEO of a leadership coaching company. He's got 200 employees. This is, this is his book. We run a 200 employee leadership coaching company, yet we don't lead ourselves. We say yes to so many unnecessary customer requests, and we avoid difficult conversations internally all the time. We have so much potential that remains untapped. He's seeing the story of every CEO that I've ever worked with and with my own personal experience in running companies. And so when I built my first company, after I sold it, I got curious. And I created an assessment. And I said, I wonder how often leaders are doing what I did in active addiction in the workplace. And so I gave it to over 5,000 leaders. I gave my assessment to leaders, four divisions within Google, three divisions within Dell, leaders from the boardroom to the classroom to the mailroom to the living room, every type of leader in government, nonprofit, startup, you name it. 90% of them said that they say yes to someone they should say no to, they are high weaknesses, and they avoid difficult conversations. Which is crazy. The leaders of this world are doing what I did in active addiction. And so here's the interesting thing about business. When you scale a company, it's all about being able to identify the things that you can't control and surrendering them and then focusing on what you can. So you can't control your customers, you can't control global markets, you can't control supply chain and employees. Companies can't control our stuff. So you know what they do? They create systems to control what they can. They don't just sell, they have a system for how they sell. They don't just market, they have a system for how they market. They have a system for how they implement a product. They have a system for how they manage IT, HR systems, financial systems, management systems. Anything that's important to a business, they give you a system to manage it. And yet, there is no system that empowers leaders and their employees to say no, share their weaknesses, and have difficult conversations. And so I learned this first thing when I was building my first company. As a matter of fact, I was an expert at saying yes when I should say no, right? And all these things. And in my corporate America, I saw people doing this all the time. They would say yes to meetings they shouldn't attend. They would hide the fact that they didn't know how to use Microsoft Excel. They wouldn't have a difficult conversation with a coworker. And so, as an addict, I had to become a master of the opposite in order to live. I had to say no. I got 19 years clean. I said no for over 19 years to a drug or a drink. Because I was given a system to do that. A 12-step system. I had to become the master of sharing my weaknesses. I, as a Californian, moved to Nashville, Tennessee, walked into a room of self-admitted drug addicts and said, I'm a drug addict and I need a sponsor. And anyone familiar with the eighth or ninth step knows that difficult conversations are hard. I had become a master at saying no, sharing weaknesses and having difficult conversations. So I thought that if, as CEO of my first company, if I was open and honest about that struggle, my team would say no to things, share their weaknesses, and have difficult conversations. But it didn't happen because they didn't have a system. It's like looking at an addict and saying, hey, you should just get clean. Well, how well does that work? Or even giving them a book, a 12-step book. There's a reason that we have sponsors and meetings. You need a full program in order to do that. Well, I submit to you that the leaders of this world need a program to say no, share their weaknesses and have the conversations. They don't have one, so I'm on a mission to give it to them. And it's a thing that I have to save my life. So let's look at the, addition, the uh, definition of addiction again. Doing the same thing repeatedly despite negative consequences. 
When I interview leaders, they say yes to things that they shouldn't say yes to all the time. So maybe the leaders of this world, in addition to the addicts, maybe we're all addicts, because it's the only way that you can explain why people in business are saying yes when they should say no when it hurts them, hiding their weaknesses when it hurts them, and avoiding different conversations when it hurts them. And maybe those of us in recovery have something to offer them. So, when I'm talking to leaders, maybe not as much for this group, I always say, you saw my title of my presentation, you heard I was an addict, you thought I was going to talk about my intervention, and then I say, welcome dudes and dudettes, this is your intervention. Because it's time to stop saying this. Yes. So let's, start, let's talk about these real quick, just so you can see how crazy this is. We're going to spend 31 hours a month in unnecessary meetings. Okay? So here's an example. I work with a company that's now source software development company called Pro 10. They said, Mike, we say yes to so many meetings, it's killing our productivity, but we don't know how to stop it. I was like, I can wait. I said yes to drugs. I, I didn't know how to stop that either, and it was, it was actually killing me. So instead of telling them to say no, I said, what if I give you the system that addicts used to recover? I gave them that system, and at the end of the workshop that we did, they canceled 30 hours worth of weekly recurring meetings that ended up saving them 6,000 hours a year. The Harvard MBAs couldn't figure it out, but a little recovery matter came in and showed that he didn't recover, and it changed their world. I'm not special, the system is. Hiding a weakness. Also, if I'm not special, that means we all have the power to activate the potential of recovery and co-opt it to create great leaders in this world. Here's another example. This is Emily, okay? So she's a 30-year-old consulting prodigy at a healthcare consulting firm. She's a $3.5 million contract with a health system, and her point of contact with that health system is a 65-year-old male surgeon. Every part of that man doesn't want to be told what to do by a young woman. And so he goes to her with a problem, and she doesn't know how to solve it. And all of a sudden, she has imposter syndrome. She's like, oh my God. Like, you guys can probably relate. You ever have someone ask you a question like, I should know the answer? And so she's scared she's going to get found out. So she's going to do what every employee in this world does. She's going to hide it. And she's going to hurt the customer. She's going to hurt herself. And she's going to hurt her employer the same way an addict that doesn't ask for help. Hurts their families and themselves. So instead of saying, hey, just share your weaknesses, we gave her a system based off of what I learned in recovery. She went to her boss and said, I have no idea how to solve this problem. And he said, well, I trust you more because I don't know how to solve this problem. Together they went to the customer and said, we don't know how to solve this problem. The customer said, well, now I trust you more because no one knows how to solve this problem. And they figured it out together. And that's what happens when you admit a weakness. You think it's going to hurt, but it helps. So last one, avoid difficult conversations. 70% of employees are avoiding difficult conversations. This stuff is a bigger epidemic than addiction. And I know I've seen a lot. It is isn't hurt that, but it's a bigger epidemic. It's happening everywhere. So 70% of employees are avoiding difficult conversations. Let me give you an example. When my TED Talk went viral, an executive at Google called me and asked me to come to Mountain View, California and work with her team. And she was the leader of all global marketing at Google. I couldn't believe she was calling me, right? I have a college degree. I feel less than. I'm like, what am I going to tell them? And when I get there, I'm like, so why did you call me, Lisa? And she's like, here's the thing about Googlers. Googlers are really smart and they're really nice. And that's a really big problem. Because my team directs the strategy of 2,000 employees, which is 4 million hours of productivity, and when we get in a room for one day to determine our strategies, everybody's intelligence identifies 15 initiatives that we should go, go do, but because they're so nice, no one challenges them. And we try to do them all and we fail. We need someone to say no to us. And I'm like, man, I can relate. Gave them the system based on what actions to recover. They had 12 different conversations and they walked out with a different strategy. The point is, 
The principles that addicts use to recover can not only create, transform the lives of addicts, their loved ones, and the communities in which they live, it can actually transform leadership in the world as we know it and revolutionize how the world leads itself. So at this point, maybe, you know, for those of you that are like in, in business or in the professional world, you might be like, you know, Mike, there's a lot of knowledge out there. I've read the book on saying no. I've read the book on being vulnerable. Um, raise your hand if you're familiar with Renee Brown. All right, a couple of you. So uh, some people call me a poor man's Renee Brown. <laughs> And when I saw her TED Talk, I bought her books on authenticity and vulnerability. I read them, I loved them, and I gave them to my entire company that I was running. And we were so authentic and vulnerable for like a week. <laughs> Just like an addict that gets inspired to not use and they start working out and eating healthy for like a week, if they're lucky. And then how long does it last after inspiration? Not very long. So here's the lie that leaders have been taught. It's the same lie that we that addicts think. Knowledge will solve this problem. You don't think I knew that my drug addiction was a problem? I knew it was a problem. It didn't stop me. I got knowledge. You guys familiar with this program? Yeah. For some reason, we thought it would be a great idea to have a police officer walk into a seventh grade classroom with a briefcase full of drugs, slam them on the table, and say, kids, People that do this stuff so much, they don't go to work, so don't touch it. I was like, do you have a subscription service where I got a briefcase like that to bring it to my house every month, please? <laughs> Knowledge does not stop addiction. And I don't have to get you guys to understand this, but a lot of people in the audience, raise your hand if you know someone who's an addict or you are an addict. Yep. Okay, so you have people, like I said. So you know, you can tell an addict to stop using until you are blue in the face and they won't. Here's why people yell, stop, stop, stop. They think they're going to equip you with the desire to stop. And what they don't get is, I have the desire. I bury my friends. You don't think I want to stop? I'm throwing up breath. You don't think I want to stop? I'm homeless. You don't think I want to stop? I can't fall asleep without passing out high. You don't think I want to stop? Addiction doesn't stop when you tell someone to stop. <coughs> Recovery only happens when you tell them what to start instead. And that is what leaders don't understand. They run around telling people, stop this, stop this, stop this. But when you're dealing with an addiction, stop doesn't matter. Start is everything. When I woke up at the Betty Ford Center in Rancho Morales, California, September 1st, 2002, a 28-day primary treatment facility, they didn't tell me to stop using drugs. They told me to start working a 12-step program. And so these are the principles that I've learned in recovery. So 19 years working a 12-step program, 15 years leading teams. Here's the system that I teach leaders, and you guys are going to recognize it. It's translated, so I respect the traditions of the 12 step culture that I'm a member of, but it will make sense to you. The first thing is, leaders should practice rigorous authenticity, and none of them do. They try to practice authenticity. It's easy to keep it real in front of grandma or your best friend, but when the entire company is in front of you, or the customer is in front of you, or your wife is in front of you, you have something hard to say. People clear up and they stop being their true selves. And that's where you get leaders that say yes to things that they should say no to, hiding their weaknesses, and avoiding difficult conversations. I once, when I was in corporate America, spent 26 hours trying to figure out how to do a pivot table in Microsoft Excel where I could have spent 10 minutes asking someone to help me. Practicing rigorous authenticity is every time. That's it. As an addict, that's what I have to do. I have to be as addicted to telling, to, to telling the truth as I was telling a lie. And so practicing rigorous authenticity is the goal of the system that I teach leaders. But in order for it to happen, I have to teach them something that we know that they don't. And that is you have to surrender the outcome. And this is a foreign language to leaders. They are taught in business school. You're responsible for the outcome. You need to obsess over outcomes. Most of us are taught that. That's how we get leaders that are so distracted with how much their employees suck instead of asking themselves, what can I do to get better? 
You want an example of how our entire nation is wired to waste energy because we can't surrender the outcome? Not that long ago, we had a presidential election and independent of your politics, what you could control was casting a vote, but how much time did we waste talking about the outcome after we did that? And that is the goal of what's happening in every single company in the world. Leaders are wasting 50% of their energy focusing on things they can't control at the expense of the things that they can. But when I was taught in recovery, is I had to learn, I had to get a PhD in surrendering the outcome, that's the scariest thing I've had to do. But if you learn how to surrender the outcome, if you learn how to surrender what happens when you tell someone that you're an addict, when you tell someone I messed up, when you tell someone I wronged you, I want to make amends, you do your unfair share of what I call uncomfortable work. And we are not taught uncomfortable work. At home, or in school, or in leadership, we're taught smart and hard work. That's physical and intellectual. We're not taught uncomfortable work. That's emotional. That's the pit in the middle of your stomach when you have to have a difficult conversation with someone you care about, and you avoid it. Even when you know it's the right thing to do. I usually say this to leaders, and they always nod knowingly. I ask them, how often have you seen a leader doing eight hours of smug work or hard work, avoiding five minutes of uncomfortable work? They do it all the time. This is what addicts do. We practice rigorous authenticity, we surrender the outcome, and we do uncomfortable work, and it differentiates us in the professional world. The first time I experienced this, I'm going to tell you a story about when I got out of rehab, and I, this, I went into a halfway house, because they told me I should go into a halfway house. So any of you in rehab right now, you need to go into a halfway house, if, if you haven't already. If you're in a halfway house, power to you. Actually, I don't need to tell you what you needed. My experience was I was powerful. We do not give advice. So, I, I'm in this halfway house, I have five business days to get a job, and I go and I apply everywhere. But my resume is terrible. I have a five-year gap from active addiction, I don't have a college degree. My professional reference is my therapist from rehab. That's not a good look when you're applying for jobs. And so I applied everywhere, and on day three, one place calls me for an interview. And it's a place called Sam Goody. Now, if you're older than me, you would call this a record store. If you're my age, you would call it a CD store. And if you're under 30, you have no idea what the F I'm talking about. Now raise your hand if you're like me and you remember standing outside of Tower Records waiting for Guns N' Roses, usually illusion one and two. All right, I see you. Thank you. I'm not alone. So a lot of people want to get this, but I would go to this job interview for a place that's now at the front. And I call my sponsor on the way. I'm like, look, man, if I tell them the truth that you know, I'm an addict and that's why I have a, a gap in my work history, I'm not going to get the job. So what do I tell him? He says, Mike, it's really simple. I tell him the truth. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. This job involves access to the cash register. If I tell them the truth, I won't get the job. I don't get the job, I get kicked out of a halfway house. I get kicked out of a halfway house, I'm on the street. If I'm on the street, I'm going to use. And if I use, I'm going to die. So you got to tell me something else to say. Because you know, my mind goes to the worst outcome possible, right? But the biggest nightmare scenario possible. My sponsor says, no, but you don't understand is if you don't practice rigorous authenticity, surrender the outcome and do uncomfortable work, you're going to die anyway. And so I was in a position where I had to share my weakness and have a difficult conversation with a prospective employer. And when I talk to leaders about this, they may not relate to a drug addict having to talk about a story, but they absolutely relate to having to share something professionally that they think is going to hurt their ability to be successful. Now, seven or eight years later, I've got seven or eight years clean. I've worked my way up the corporate ladder, and I've left my job at the height of the recession. And I said, everybody's talking about access to health care. How nobody, we don't have enough access to health care. I did some research, and 99% of health care appointments are being made over the phone. And I'm like, that's crazy. I can make an online appointment for my cat, my car, and my hair, but I can't do it for my health? So we created the first ever digital self-scheduling platform for healthcare so patients could schedule an appointment online. But I didn't know anything about healthcare. We didn't have any investors. I've never been an entrepreneur. And so I went out there in the middle of the recession. I'm a recovery night, man. I'm playing with the house money. I thought I'd be dead, dead at the age of 30. I founded the company at age 31. And I'm like, yeah, I'll go for it. 
And so I maxed out my credit card, I drained my bank account, and I withdrew my 401k. We never took an investor, but I still say the 26% interest from Citibank made them an investor. And I found out later, entrepreneurs aren't supposed to use your credit cards, whoops. Um, and so I bet everything on starting this company, and I went and I started presenting our service to hospitals across the country, and nine out of 10 would, would either kick me out or knock me out. And one out of ten would be like, oh my God, you're going to change access to healthcare. The problem was, it was the recession. We were unproven. This had never been done before, so people weren't signing up fast. And so I, I did a financial model and I realized that by the end of 2010, we were going to run out of money. And I was going to have to fire my team. And so I went to one of the hospitals that we were contracted with and I said, hey, you're seeing such great results. We only have six hospitals under contract. We need the cash to grow our business. I'll give you a killer deal on all 50 of your hospitals. If you'll do a deal with us by the end of the year so we can grow our business. After months of negotiation, one night they called us up and they said, Mike, we're going to put you in all 50 hospitals. And we're going to spend $3 million advertising the product in 13 states. And we had like a $300 marketing spend at our company. So that was like huge. That night we were like, so excited. Only 1% of startups ever cross the threshold of a million dollars in revenue. And we were going to do it on this one deal. We celebrated the I-5. It was the highest ever of them without drugs. And then we cannot write this stuff. The very next day, I get a call and I find out that our software had failed at one of our six hospitals. And I couldn't say this in my TED Talk and my book, but I'll tell you that when you are in healthcare, you are governed by a statute called HIPAA. And the biggest no-no in healthcare is allowing someone to access a patient record, and someone had been able to access one patient record at one hospital in our software the same day that we had gotten that notification that they were going to go nationwide with us, and we had a one in six chance that it was at the hospital that was part of this enterprise deal. And guess which hospital it was? It was the one that was the basis of the whole expansion. And so I'm sitting there, I'm looking at my team, and I'm like, oh my God. I look at our contract, and it says we have to tell them within 24 hours that we've had a security incident. And I know that's going to kill the deal. My team's going to be out looking for a job. My company will run out of money. I'll be bankrupt. And then my partner says, there's another option. I think we're overreacting. We only impacted one patient. We didn't disclose any sensitive information. They don't know and the hospital doesn't know. Let's not ruin the company over this one little incident. So once again, I'm in a situation. Now I'm CEO of a startup, never done there before, and I'm tempted to say yes when I could say no. I'm tempted to hide a weakness, and I'm tempted to avoid a difficult conversation with our customer. In both of those circumstances, I didn't rely on someone just saying you should tell them. I had a step-by-step -step system that I've been working to save my life as a recovering addict. A step-by-step -step system that allowed me to go into Sam Goody in that interview, tell them I was a recovering addict and get the job anyway. A step-by-step -step system that got me promoted eight times in eight years in corporate America, that is not a published Harvard MBA on the screen. That is a California hippie with long hair, you can't see it, but two hoop earrings, a big beard, and flip flops. But my mentors became my employees because I was more willing to tell people where I sucked. Because telling them that I don't know how to use Microsoft Excel wasn't really as scary as telling people I was an addict. And I got, I got uh, my talent developed, I got mentors, and I got better, and I got promoted eight times in eight years. A step by step system where I said no to my partner. I called that customer with my, and, and I told them about the security incident and they laughed at me. And I was like, why are you laughing at me? This is the biggest moment of my life. And they said, when we get a call like this, it's because someone's compromised 20,000 patients. We know we have vendors where so this happens with one or two and they never call us. We can't believe you called. I'm like, what does that mean? They're like, it means we can trust you. Within 18 months, we were undergoing a nationwide expansion with every major health system in the U.S. We never took any outside capital, but we practiced rigorous authenticity, we surrendered the outcome, and we did uncomfortable work, and we built an E500 company. 
And so this is a picture of my team that might be required by a publicly traded company. What you're looking at is 50 beautiful people, only two of them outside of me are recovering addicts. That means the other 47 are normies. With the normies in the audience, I don't know if you know that. That's what we call them. We call them normies. My wife has to be called a normie. And so the interesting thing is when my business started, we were the first in our space to do what we do. By the time we were acquired, there were 20 competitors, and we had the lowest amount of resources versus anyone, but we were number one in market share. And it wasn't because anyone on my team had an IV degree. Nope, nobody. It wasn't because we had a patent. Nope. We didn't have investment. We didn't have board members. We didn't have anyone who had taken a start to a million revenue, let alone 10 before. We had the one thing that none of our competitors had, a principle, a, com a company that lived by the principles of practice rigorous authenticity, surrender the outcome, do uncomfortable work. What I had learned in meetings, we did what drug addicts do to recover. And what that meant was, everybody in the company said no, whether it was me, each other, or our customers, unlike everybody else in this world. Everybody on my team volunteered their weaknesses without fear so we could all go like crazy instead of hiding. I never, I, I never once had to hire an outside leader to replace them for one of my leaders. And we had really difficult conversations, but they made us so much better. And so after I sold my company, I wrote the book, Great Leaders About Drug Addicts, because my mission is to revolutionize the rules of leadership by equipping the world's leaders with what I equip my team with, with what saved my life. And so if we go back to the story that I gave you of the CEO, Scott McAllister, his team, he's got this leadership coaching company, he's paid to coach companies like Microsoft, and yet they say the yes too much, they work, they have too many difficult, they have very too many difficult conversations, and his entire company is using our system of practice rigorous authenticity, surrender the outcome, do uncomfortable work, and they've only been doing it for six months, and they've already seen a million dollars in quantitative ROI for, for rolling out this system. They're literally telling their employees, essentially, you have to do what you have to do to recover in order to be a better leader in this company. And we're doing this for companies all over the world. It's crazy. So, if you're an addict in the audience, I want you to know something. Actually, you want everyone in this boat and go to, uh, close out to go into the q and I want you to know something. I meant when I said that the worst thing about me is the best thing about me. People often ask, say, I bet, Michael, I bet that when you do your prayers in the morning, that you thank God for your recovery. And my answer is no, I don't. The first thing I do is I thank God I'm being emotional. I thank God for my addiction. Then I thank him for my recovery. Because I have something that the other leaders of this world do not have. I have a loaded gun pointed at my head the rest of my life that says I have to practice these principles. Most leaders don't have that incentive. And it allows me to live with a level of freedom and energy and authenticity that most leaders don't. And secondly, even leaders like Scott who believe in what I'm teaching, they don't have a place to go to practice. But I can go to any city in this entire world and look up a 12-step meeting and go for free and be surrounded by like-minded people that are practicing these principles like it's an academy that's churning out the best leaders of this world. Most leaders don't have the incentive or the opportunity to practice these principles and because of my addiction, thanks to my addiction, I have both. And so this is my second favorite quote in the world. But it illustrates the power. We all know the struggle of addiction. Let's talk about the struggle of a leader. To be nobody but yourself in a world which is doing its best day and night to make you like everybody else needs to fight the hardest battle which any human being can fight and never stop fighting. I love this quote because when we teach leaders how to be rigorously authentic, surrender the outcome, and do uncomfortable work. Unlike me, where I go to a meeting a day in early recovery, one hour a day, they're spending 40 hours a week practicing something. And they're either practicing inauthenticity or authenticity. So when we do this, we create workspaces 
that actually train people to work in a way that lead that recovery addicts are taught to live. And as a result, when they go home to the PTA meetings and the neighborhoods and the families and the in-laws and the friends and they're tempted to hide themselves true to this battle that is quote. They're equipped with a skill set to win that battle. And here's my proof. My company didn't raise any money so we couldn't pay the best salaries. But my company has something that's almost never heard of. Zero percent negative attrition. What that means is in six years, I never lost one employee that I wanted to keep. And it wasn't because we had no money. It was because we taught our team how to win the battles that everybody in this world needs to win, that only drug addicts are taught how to win. So I know it can kind of be a crazy idea to take the plight of a drug addict and relate it to leadership, but if the principles that an addict uses to recover, if practicing rigorous authenticity, surrendering the outcome, and doing uncomfortable work can just take one of a million addicts and transform them from this dude to a successful leader, a successful father, a successful husband, and most importantly, a successful big bird, <laughs> then what can it do for the leaders of this world? What if the leaders of this world took what we're teaching them and they practiced rigorous authenticity, they surrendered the outcome, they did uncomfortable work, and as a result, Everybody in their team was free to say no to what they needed to say no to to protect their time and reclaim $500 a year. If everybody in their team shared their weaknesses so they grew like crazy the way I did from kiosk to keynote, and they had all the difficult conversations so they could truly know the spirit of being understood the way recovering addicts do, what if every organization in this world created a space where their employees could say no, share weaknesses, and have difficult conversations? How would that change their employees' lives? How would that change those organizations? And if we got every company in this world to do this, and every leader in this world to do this, how would it change the world? A world driven by practicing rigorous authenticity, surrendering without them doing uncomfortable work, I dare say we would stop addiction where it starts. Because if someone had taught me how to do that when I was young, I might have been less tempted to use the drugs. Now I don't know that for sure, but I know it would change this world. So, I'm going to close this out, and we'll go to the Q&A, but I'm going to close it by saying, I know there's a great leader living inside of each and every one of you, but if you want the world to see the full measure of your greatness, you're going to have to do what recovering drug addicts do. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you, guys. Yes, sir. All right, we get a mic and we're going to hand it off to whoever has questions for Michael. All right, start with you. Thanks, uh, thanks Michael. But I've got to know first. Oh, uh, closer. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I uh, I got to know which came first, COVID or the, your mask free? <laughs> When I do a longer presentation, I actually make it part of what I do. So, you want to talk about something trippy. I started writing my book in 2018, quit my job in 2019 to finish it, finish it in 2019, and we set a publish date of May 2020. And in my book, I outline a program called the Mask Free Program because when I was in rehab in 2002, they put down these paper masks. And they had us decorate one to look like who we wanted to show the world, and one to look like who we thought we were hiding. And ever since then, I took this idea of hiding my true self behind a mask as a way to communicate being inauthentic. And so in 2019, well before the pandemic started, or at least we were aware of it, I outlined a program called the Mask Free Program, and I published my book in May of 2020. And so I'm doing social media to promote it, 
and I'm getting death threats from people online, and I'm like responding to them, and I'm like, no, 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 I'm talking about authentic leadership, and people are going from, I'm going to kill you to, that's cool. <laughs> and so, you know, we, we've, we, we've, we've toned the volume down in the mass free stuff, but uh, I'm not fully re removing it because that's me practicing rigorous and authenticity, but I think everything in this world happens for a reason, but that was a very interesting coincidence. <laughs> great question, great answer. Next. All right. I'm Michael, I'm Richard, and I'm an addict. Um, hey, Richard. The question that I have is because I've, I've watched your uh, some of your videos and, and read some of the literature, and I'm in a, a position, actually, I work for a Nashville-based company, so hey, man, welcome home. Um, so when it comes to not practicing uh, rigorous authenticity and saying no, being genuine in those aspects, what does the difficult conversation look like with those folks and the accountability around that for people with inside of the organization? Um, are you asking like, what does it look like when people are having difficult conversations inside of companies? Yeah, how do you how do you build that into the human mind? Yeah, so uh, it's just like um, recovery from addiction. So I, I had to work a step one. I had to understand how my life was unmanageable. But, you know, one of the things we say is it's impossible to spot self-deception. So when we're working with companies, one of the things we do is help them understand just how pervasive their very difficult conversations. So, for example, we list out like a ton of different manifestations of this. So um, manifestations of this include not giving performance feedback to an employee. That's what actually extremely common in all leadership organizations. Not saying no to meetings without clear outcomes. Not saying, uh, setting clear expectations with customers and agreeing to unrealistic expectations. Not challenging strategic plans that are set forth by executives. Uh, there's probably, we've identified and mapped about 20 different consistent behaviors that exist when people are avoiding difficult conversations in the workplace. And then if you take that and you map that against um, the different segments of people, so inside of the company, you've got like seven different categories of stakeholders. You've got the people that you report to. Um, even if you're a CEO, it's a board, it's investors or whatever. You've got the people that are your peers. You've got the people that are your direct reports. You've got yourself. And then you've got external stakeholders like customers, external stakeholders like partners, investors, vendors, and then you've got friends and family. And what we find is, when you start looking at how they avoid difficult conversations, whether it's they're not giving performance feedback to an employee, let's say, you'll find they are also not giving constructive criticism to like their significant other or someone else. And so what we start to be able to see is they are addicted to avoiding difficult conversations first in one particular area at work, but they start to see that it's in everywhere. And you start to see, like, we did a work with a bank in, in Colorado where all of the managers were trying to look like servant leaders. And so they were attending their direct reports meetings, even though they didn't need to be there. But they, they were scared to say, I don't need to be there and I have a big project I need to work on. And so they avoided the difficult conversation of do I need to be there because they were scared of what the direct report would think and they were wasting their time. It was ridiculous. All right, thanks for your time. I said, what was that? I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody in the back? Hi, Michael. My name is Amy Colbert. I um, am an alcoholic in recovery, and I uh, operate a recovery support center in the Dayton, Ohio area. Uh, I want to thank you for just your message. Um, you're one of the reasons I, I kind of got invited to this whole thing late, and I thought, you know what, I need to go do this uh, because I wanted to, I didn't realize you'd be uh, virtual, but it doesn't really matter. I just wanted to surround myself and, and see what I could learn. And these are things, you know, a lot of what you say, I am really bad about having those conversations, those difficult conversations. And recently I'm, I took on this big venture of bringing in a, uh, organizing this grief workshop to address overdose stats. And um, I was so excited to have hospice as a sponsor. And I started treating them 
uh, as a co-host. Uh, because again, I, I was happy that, you know, to have our name associated with this really well-known name. And uh, then we got to a, a, the topic of mask. And this lady is, you know, she's got a lot of letters behind her name. She intimidated me a lot. And, uh, you know, I, I did it. I, I didn't do what I needed to do. I didn't address, uh, you know, she's like, oh, what masks are going to be required? I was like, that ain't going to fly with my board. But I didn't, you know, I didn't say that. I, in my head, I was like, oh, shit. How am I going to, you know, and... Uh, so finally, I mean, but it, it's that extra stress, that two weeks of it going on in my head um, before I finally sent the email and reestablished that, you know, and, and I was able to do so in a, in a very polite way that, you know, to establish that I'm the host. And I, I didn't even have to say that. It was all my own behavior. I was uh, treating her like she was a co-host. Um, yeah. And so it's just that, that self-awareness. And again, my program helps me with that. And... Um, I'm just really interested and, and eager to read your book. And I wanted to share one last thing. Um, my shirt says, explaining recovery to a normie. And then it's obviously got a lot of calculus or you know some sort of high tech math on there. So I appreciated what you said about normies. So thank you so uh, much thank you. For, for sharing with us tonight. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for doing the work that you do. My name's Jay, I'm an addict. Um, do you feel like, which I kind of feel like this, do you feel like the AANA distinction creates a certain division amongst fellow uh, addicts? Because to me, like when I stand up in the meeting, because I've also, I also suffered from alcoholism, but I've, I've also so suffered from narcotic addiction, but I more so lean towards the narcotic the NA way because I don't see any division, I don't see the difference in an alcoholic and in an, in an NA person. Like, it's like saying, if I stand up and say I'm an alcoholic addict, that's like saying I'm a carrot vegetable. Like, do, do you, do you feel like that creates some type of division in, in the NA, AA community? Um, I think that's a great question. Um, and if I didn't feel like I was kind of conducting myself as a public speaker in this moment, I'd tell you which fellowship I attend, but respect the traditions, I'm leaving that alone. But I've been in both of those fellowships, and um, I used to think about that in terms of how it affected me. Th this, is, this is what I think. It can, it can alienate people if they let it. So in my experience, when you work the steps, and you start to practice these principles in all your affairs, you learn what the spirit of anonymity is. And one of the spirits of anonymity is looking at similarities, not differences. And so, what, what I've, when I've seen people use the differences between the fellowships as a negative, it's usually people that are not, that are either having a momentary character defect present itself, or though they are not very well versed in our program, they're not practicing our principles. Um, because the reason that we have different 12-step fellowships is because of the power of identification. And I actually explain this when I do my workshops for leaders. I tell them, look, you might all think that you do things that are different than saying yes when you could say no, but I'm going to make you all work at work at our action card and saying yes when you could say no, because here's a problem. When a bunch of people are sitting around and one said, I have a problem with whiskey, and those that I have a problem with wine, and those that I have a problem with beer, they all thought they had a unique problem they couldn't help each other solve. When they all said I struggle from alcohol, they were able to together see the problem and together create a solution. And then eventually, in the first 12-step fellowship, AA, there were enough drug addicts that said, you know what, I identify more closely with drugs, and so NA was born. And, and if you look at the history of how NA was created, it was, it was helped by AA to be created. And then eventually, NA has enough coke addicts that there's coke that coke anonymous, right? And speed anonymous, or well, I guess they don't call it speed anymore, but I'm like dating myself. But what you get is, you know, we've got like, what, like 212 step fellowships? I don't even know. And so I would say, you are going to have people in recovery that use it to create division, 
But that's because they're acting out in their character defects and they're not actually practicing the principles of that program. Anyone really working a 12-step program will know we are all the same. It's just about the power of identification. Great question, though. Thank you. Other questions? You guys can ask me anything. People don't believe that, but did you listen to my presentation? You can ask me anything, dude. Man, uh, I bet you never stayed duck shit too long. You know what I mean? Uh, that's Addy. Wait, what'd you say? Wait, what'd you say? I said, I bet you never stayed duck shit too long. No. <laughs> you know, you know, saying, you know like, as normal people can't wake up, you know, like, five o'clock in the morning and be flat broke and spent two or three hundred dollars by, you know, the first two hours. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, but uh, I'm really, uh, your presentation was, man, it was, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It was inspirational. Inspirational. Yeah, thank you. But uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing your story with us. I appreciate that. Um, just so you know, like when we got this request, I don't typically do a speaking engagement at this time. I'm usually with my family. Um, and Brooke on my team, she's the only person on my team that's a normie. Um, everybody else is a recovering addict. And but she's she helped build this and she's like, uh, okay, I was like, I can't do it at night, no, no. She's like, This is your people. I was like, Yep. <laughs> Cause I remember, you know, like never say no to carry the message, man. So um, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to carry it. And sometimes I worry uh, that I'm not doing our, our message justice. So I try to just carry my message and I try to balance both and it's not, um, it's not a delicate or easy thing to do. I think we have time for maybe one, maybe two more questions, depending. All right, here, brother. Hi, Michael. I'm Andrew Addict. Uh, I'm Andrew Addict, Michael. Um, financially, I'm in ruins. So I'm 48 years old. I'm practicing in treatment right now. This is uh, several times I've been through this. Uh, I've lost houses over the years. I've lost property. Uh, despite hearing what you said and you know similarities, where's a good beginning? <laughs> Do you feel uh, to restart? Other than you know, obviously with 12 steps, but. You know, I, I, I have felonies also. You know, I, I appreciate the fact that you're on with the honesty thing and anonymity is full disclosure too. And trying to get a new job, I'm terrified. So really it's a question of do you have any good advice for me? Um, so first of all, thank you for sharing. Um, and I'll tell you when, so when, when my home group's done, a lot of people know about my story in, in, in Nashville and the recovery community. Um, and I, I, I try to, you know, not focus on it. But I'll, I'll get someone that comes up to me and they'll be like, hey man, I, I want to start a business. I want to be successful professionally. And the thing I always tell them is if you don't build a one to two year solid foundation of recovery, it doesn't matter. But if you do, and you throw everything that you can into it, you take suggestions, you will build a skill set that differentiates you from 99% of the leaders out there, which is what I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. And so a lot of people in recovery will see their professional life as separate from what they have to learn in recovery. And that's really part of my objective in carrying this message is I got tired of talking because I've been successful professionally, a lot of the addicts in my community would reach out to me for advice. I'd be like, I'm just going to tell you what every other effing addict would tell you. It doesn't matter that I've had success. I'm going to literally tell you what everyone would tell you. But like, well, it's different when you're getting a job interview. It's different. I'm not saying that you don't be sensitive in certain circumstances. But if you work a program and you get a sponsor and you go to meetings and you activate and leverage that, you should be able to navigate whatever life throws at you. And that's been my experience. But here's the thing. A lot of times, addicts want a novel solution. Addicts are addicted to short-term gratification. We don't have what it takes to prioritize long-term gratification. 
So if something becomes not novel, it no longer gives us um, that zing. And that's how you get people that do 90 90 and they walk out. And so when people say to me, they say, like, you know, so what are the odds of, of me relapsing in, in my first year? I'm like, dude, I don't know, like 90%? And they're like, why is that? I'm like, you have a 100% chance of staying clean. You just have a 99% chance that you'll stop following suggestions at some point. And so um, to just kind of really illustrate this point, my last sponsor has since passed away picked up something like 40 white key tags, relapsed like 40 times. Got arrested for trafficking heroin, age of 17, had multiple felonies, like all that kind of stuff. And what I tell, I want to tell you is that last key tag, their story is the same as mine, man. They did the work, past the point of it being interesting and new. They stayed out of the relationship, they didn't chase their money, they didn't fight the suggestions. They're finally broken and they were willing and they did the work. And my God, man, I tell you how many addicts I've buried, dude. And the only difference between me and them is I was willing to do the uncomfortable work. I don't know why, but I was willing to do the uncomfortable work. And so, you know, and then sometimes people say, oh, you're just addicted to something new, working at a 12-step program. I'm like, yup. What's the problem? You're addicted to oxygen. I'm not hating. <laughs> like, it works for you. So, like, you know, I, I put my disease to work when it comes to my recovery. So, last thing I'll say on this is, it's one thing I'm good at addict is hustling and pursuing something that I want. If I work these steps and I talk to people and I hear enough stories, I'm going to find what I want and then I'm going to be, I'm going to put my addict on the job and I'm going to get what I want. That means I'm going to go do what they tell me to do. Now, actually, I will say one more thing because I feel like I lack empathy for what it's like being in the, new, in the beginning. So let me share this. When I, I was on fire for the program my first year, and then I got a job, and, and, I, and, and I started trying to work, and, and I got a place, and so all of a sudden I kind of started marrying my recovery. I showed five, five minutes late for the meeting, leave five minutes early, but that means I could intentionally call my sponsor when I knew he wouldn't be available so I could get credit for the call. And about 18 months clean, you know, my sponsor said, you can stay clean on ego only so long. And then I went to a meeting and a woman shared about how she relapsed at six years clean and her relapse had started, had started with one year clean. And she just stopped doing the deal. And I walked out of there and I said to my sponsor, I want to end up like her. He said, so don't, wait a minute, so don't end up like her. And I'm like, I got to figure out why I'm not willing to do the work, why I'm not willing to go to the meetings, go to dinner after the meeting, all that kind of stuff. And he's like, Mike, you don't have to figure out why. That, that's you thinking you have to want to do this. Don't want to do this. Just fucking do it. I'm going to swear. That's one swear word I'm going to say here. He said, just effing do it. And I was like, okay, man, I'm going to do it. He's like, all right, you come to dinner after the meeting? He was like, no, man, I'm going to go home and watch Real World. <laughs> he's like, what was this talking about? And so I went to dinner, and ever since then, I, I got the message that up until that moment in my life, I had let what I wanted, what my brain thought, dictate what I did, and I decided that I was going to execute someone else's playbook because I wanted what they had more than I wanted what I had. Much appreciated. That's great advice. Yeah, dude, I appreciate you, brother. Keep working it, man. Thank you. All right. We're about three minutes over here. Michael, we want to respect and honor your time, get you back to your family. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Can we give him a hand? Appreciate very much your contribution here tonight, Michael. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for having me. You saw my contact info. If you want to hit me up, send me a question over my website or whatever, please do, okay? Thank you. We'll do. All right. Thanks, guys. Real quick, guys, before you all head out, I just want to thank you all for joining us tonight, making time to be here. Um, I hope you take something away from this. Um, I hope I've taken something away from it myself. Um, take some inspiration, take some motivation, take some belief in yourself, and definitely take some food. All right, because we'll come back there forever. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Have a good night.
Yeah, 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 yeah